The Galaxy headed to the international break with a convincing win over Austin FC. Sparks center Liz Cambridge denies using a racial slur at an opponent. And one quarter of the way through the year, and the Dodgers' ace is... Tony Gonzalez? We're going to describe how a guy who was fighting for a spot on the roster wound up being the Dodgers' most effective pitcher so far. Good morning. I'm James. This is your daily dose of sports and snark for the greatest sports city in the world, Los Angeles. This is Faithful Angelinos. It's May 30th, 2022. And how do I feel? Like a champ. Hey, what can I tell you? I'm still like 12 years old. I, wifey and I went to see wrestling last night. I, I splurged. <laughs> hey, we added a new subscriber yesterday. Thanks for getting in. We appreciate every last one of you. If you like the content we've been putting out about LA sports over the last few months, click and clack the like button. Click and clack the subscribe button. There's a notifications bell. Hit that. We put out a new video between 9 and 10 a.m. every day and let you know it's there. Sharing is caring. Let people know we exist and comments. I'm not perfect. So before we get to the main topic, what the heck happened to make Tony Gonsolin more effective for L.A.? We're going to go through the scoreboard, the news, and the notes. Yesterday, the Dodgers completed a four-game sweep over Arizona 3-1. They are 33 and 14 and have won 13 of the last 15 games. And their two losses, only by one run. It's impressive. Very impressive. The Galaxy defeated Austin 4 to 1. Dejan Joveljic scores twice. And of course, because the internet can't let a good thing go to waste, they took a photo of Joveljic's celebration after a goal with full chub. Yeah, and that's one way to celebrate the beginning of Pride Month, folks. But seriously. Also, the Sparks and WNBA, they defeated Minnesota 85-83. to Now, let's start off, though, with the Sparks. Liz Cambridge, quote, I did not use that slur. She denies calling a Nigerian basketball player uh, a racial slur last year. Uh, for those who were curious... It's not the end bomb. It's uh, she called allegedly called somebody a monkey. Now, here's what happened. We don't know whether or not she actually used it. She was playing as part of the Australian national basketball team. It was a tune-up for the 2021 Olympics in Tokyo. She did foul the player, and then the player allegedly attacked her on the sideline. And then in the aftermath, it was alleged that Cambridge used a racial slur. At the time, Cambridge was playing for the Las Vegas Aces. She became a free agent, signed with the Sparks. Yesterday, we were wondering, did they even know about this? Because it was never in the press. But at least uh, two Sparks players and uh, management said there were meetings before the season started. Cambridge and the players cleared the air. The players say that they have her back. It's your call whether or not she made it. I'm not going to judge. I wasn't there. Meanwhile, I'm very much fascinated by how the national press is trying to get people to freak out over the defending Super Bowl champion Rams. Aaron Donald, he's skipping OTAs. Oh my God. He's not with the team. He's, he didn't even, he's in, he's in Miami. He was watching game seven of the Celtics and Heat. Oh no, he always misses OTAs every single year. This is not a new development. He always goes home to Pittsburgh. He's lifting weights. He stays in shape. He keeps in contact with the team. They know about it. They're cool. Stop. Just cut it out. But no, the national press won't do it. Deadspin, this hokey-ass website, which is just basically, they, they became famous, God knows why. They're just committed to stirring crap up. And now they're trying to stir up even more dumb bleep about the Rams. Here's a headline. Quote, Stan Kroenke takes a victory lap at the expense of NFL owners. 
This is in reference to the fact that the NFL, they, they have all the owners ponying up to try to settle a lawsuit that St. Louis had over the Rams moving back to L.A. And Deadspin is trying to so hard to stir stuff up that they're actually trying to make us empathize with cabillionaires? Really? Oh, no. Instead of my private yacht having platinum toilets for me to poop in, I had to settle for gold. Gold toilets instead of platinum. I'm suffering. I'm an NFL owner. Nice try, Deadspin. What the hell was that? A lot of good news for the Chargers, I would say. A lot. And the first thing I want to do is I want to start, start by talking about what could be a cutting edge trend on defense. Three safeties. Three safeties in the backfield. You see, there's three teams in the NFL that already had two really good ones, and yet they added a safety in the draft as well. The Ravens did, the Bengals did, and then LA goes out and they add JT Woods to Derwin James and Nasir Adderley. Now, what does this mean? It could mean any number of things. Perhaps two of these teams are start to go with a cover three defense, where you have three defensive backs in the backfield, they're playing zone, one deep left, one deep center, one deep right. I'm not sure that's going to be the case with the Chargers. Remember, the Chargers play a defense similar to what the Rams play, where they have one defensive back play a hybrid linebacker defensive back role. They call it the star. Jalen Ramsey is the star for the Rams. Well, Derwin James plays that role for the Chargers. So it's neither, it, it could go either way. We have no idea. Player foot, pro football focus. They give rankings that you might have noticed. If you watch Sunday Night Football and the players give their hokey little self intros at the beginning of the game, they always mention where they rank in terms of where they rank according to others in terms of their position. Corey Lindsley is apparently the best center in the NFL. Okay. In addition to that, the best so-called triplets are with the Chargers, according to a poll taken of sports writers. Now, the triplets is a play on words back when the Cowboys were dominant. You had Troy Aikman at quarterback, Emmitt Smith at running back, and, and Michael Irvin, the wide receiver. They think, sports writers think, the combination of Justin Herbert... Austin Eckler and Keenan Allen comprise the best triplets in the league. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not sold on Keenan Allen being an elite receiver. I could be wrong. But when I think elite, he doesn't pop up into my head immediately. Now, for the record, the Rams were ranked as having the six best triplets. One of the main reasons was Cam Akers, their running back, was hurt for a lot of last year. Dodgers notes. We already know that Max Muncy is going to be gone for at least 10 days on the injured list, and Kevin Pillar came up to replace him, but it's not a simple one-for-one. One. This has a domino effect with the rest of the team. For example, it probably moves Chris Taylor back, from, back into the infield, okay? But what that does, obviously, it opens a hole in the outfield, and Edwin Rios is probably going to get a lot more at-bats, which is good. Edwin Rios has five home runs in the month of May. Now, on the other side, you got closer Craig Kimbrell. He has allowed five runs in his last five appearances. And those appearances don't add up to five innings. It's four and a third. So his ERA is over 10 in his last five appearances. Andrew Heaney will face batters today in a simulated game as he continues to rehab. He hasn't pitched since maybe the second week of the year. And owner... Part owner, Todd Bowley's Consortium. They have completed their purchase of Premier League team Chelsea. They are the owners now. But let's get back to this side of the island, uh, this side of the planet. This is Tony Gonsolin's third year. In the first quarter of the season, he leads the Dodgers in ERA 1.8, strikeouts with 44, and the fewest base runners allowed per inning. All of this is a surprise on a number of levels. When you think about the Dodgers pitching, even without Clayton Kershaw, you'd be talking about Julio Urias. You'd be talking about Walker Bueller. 
Gonsolin had to fight just to become the fifth starter. So it's been impressive. In Arizona, in his last appearance Saturday, he didn't even allow a walk. He retired 13 of the last 14 batters he faced. Overall, the entire year, he's allowed two earned runs or fewer in all nine starts. This is not insignificant because there was, look, there's a belief that even great pitchers will have a lousy start once every five or one where they have to battle. Gonsolin hasn't had one yet. Now, he's not going to get you super late in the game. He's only going to get you about six innings. But if you think about it, in his prior two years, he was lucky to give you five. This is the, the six-inning mark. He reached it again in Arizona. That's the third consecutive time he's done that. He's never done that before. And all of this is huge for the Dodgers because they're missing, as we all know, Clayton Kershaw. And they're also missing starter Andrew Heaney. So what led to Gonsolin falling off the map and now gaining a place with the best staff in ball? Well, there's a belief that shoulder pitchers triggered that sophomore slump for him last year, and it led to a number of things. For example, he's a strikeout pitcher. So when you're a strikeout pitcher, you're working deep into the counts, but you can't trust your mechanics when you feel like you got a twinge in your shoulder. So it would run up a pitch count early. Manager Dave Roberts recently told the LA Times that many young pitchers are guilty of nibbling at the plate instead of going for it, just going after the hitter. And now Gonsolin providing good work and going after hitters is, quote, kind of commonplace. What convinced him to go after hitters? We'll let you know in a moment. He has four pitches he can work with. In addition to the fastball, he's got a curve, slider, and splitter. Now, pitching coach Mark Pryor said his understanding, Gonsolin's understanding that he can control this arsenal is a big difference. For his part, Gonsolin said the difference is the curveball. But the real difference, if we're going to be boil it down to brass tacks, is he's been talking a lot with Clayton Kershaw about attacking hitters over the plate. Or better said, just having Kershaw just light him up and insult him. Yeah, which is crazy because if you think of Kershaw, this is the guy who spends his off seasons building houses for some of the most destitute parts on the planet. Kershaw is a bona fide good guy, but apparently you get him in the dugout, he will trash talk, perhaps. And he was he would allegedly tell Gonsolin, quote, that was the stupidest pitch. You just wasted an opportunity to be ahead of the hitter, and you probably cost yourself maybe five pitches because you're working from behind the whole time. Now, if you're hearing that, do you kind of shrink in your chair a little bit? See, Kershaw was saying picking a spot to steal strikes adds up over the course of the game, and it probably gives you an extra inning in the long haul. In other words, from five innings to six. Quote, what's the point of throwing a nasty split, the first pitch, if they're just taking it? Even if it's a strike, you've already wasted your best pitch in a situation where he's taking. Unquote. This is... Fascinating to me, not just for Gonsolin, but it also mentions something to me about the passage of time. What do I mean? Because this is the stuff, if you remember when Clayton Kershaw was young and couldn't, hadn't figured it out yet, he was berated by longtime Braves great Greg Maddox, who was traded to the Dodgers back when Kershaw was young. These are the lessons that get passed on through time. Now, I'm not going to sit there and tell you that Tony Gonsolin is going to be the next Clayton Kershaw. But he damn sure isn't necessarily in a place where he has to fight for a spot on the team anymore, is he? And the Dodgers are better off for it. All because of Greg Maddox and being listened to. But you tell me what you think. If you enjoyed today's conversation, then thank you very much for watching. Feel free to like and subscribe to Faithful Angelinos. I'm James. Again, we'll be back tomorrow. Faithful Angelinos is a Kian Corte El Queso production. Have a good day.